Hi, welcome back to another edition of our tour of the museum here at the Florida Keys History and Discovery Center. I'm Brad Bertelli, the curator. And again, um, if you have questions any time along the way, feel free to type them in and Aaron will let me know and we can get those answered on air. If not, I'd be, I'll go back after, after uh, we sign off here and I'll answer them as we go along. Um, so today we're gonna talk about the big anchor behind me um, but we're also going to talk about connections. Um, one of the things that I've learned as I've been studying the history of the Florida Keys for the last decade um, is the more, well, the first, the more I learn, the less I know. And also, um, the more I, I, I learn about all the different aspects of, the, of history, the more connected they all seem to be. So with that being said, we're going to go back to our good friend, Pedro Menendez, um, who we've talked about a couple of times already. Um, he is the one uh, who, who helped to found St. Augustine in 1565. He lost his son, Juan Menendez, in a hurricane in 1563. Um, and, we, and we talked about that when we showed the bronze cannon, seems like six months ago, but it was, I think, seven weeks ago when we first started doing these presentations. Um, but Pedro Menendez was very trusted by the King of Spain. And um, it all happened, it kind of began when he was bringing, he was the uh, commander general bringing a fleet of, um, of, of uh, escorting a fleet back from, uh, from um, Spain to the, or from, uh, from the New World back home to Spain. And he encountered some pirates uh, and, de and defeated the pirates and safely brought the treasures back home to Spain, which put him in great favor. And uh, so, but he, those, the two became very connected, and uh, the king and his council asked Pedro Menendez to do a study of how to make the transport from the New World to the Old World, um, and, and Menendez studied this for quite some time. And some of the things that he came up with were um, first to put, uh, First, to have the fleets travel in mass. So instead of one ship going here and one ship going you know, at a time, that the, the, the fleets would be organized. So all of these, these big groups would come together and that, they, and that they would be escorted by a series or you know, at least two or more uh, Spanish galleons, that, you know, kind of armed, an, an armed escort. And the two ships that would, the two main ships that would accompany these, these uh, fleets would be the Capitana and the Almiranta. Now the Capitana would be a Spanish galleon armed with 60 guns or however many guns, depending on the boat, would lead the, would lead the, uh, uh, the fleet and the Almiranta would kind of take up the, uh, the end of the fleet and kind of protect from, from the rear. Every convoy had an Almiranta, every convoy had a, had a Capitana and there were other ships as well, auxiliary uh, galleons and, and ships that would accompany these fleets. Um, another thing that, uh, that Menendez uh, figured out was that all the ships would meet in Havana. They would start from, from you know, Veracruz, other p parts of, uh, of Mexico and Central America, and they would, they would come to Havana, and from Havana, they would begin their, their trip back home to Spain. Now, in the case of Pedro Menendez's son, Juan Menendez, uh, one of the other rules was to leave you know, no later than you know, August, um, to help avoid the big storms, that, the hurricanes that, that would come in. And of course, um, Pedro Menendez, his son Juan Menendez, bleh, Juan Menendez decided to leave later in, uh, in the year, in late August, early September, and did encounter a hurricane and, and his ship uh, ended up sinking. Um, but when it comes to the 1733 treasure fleet, which is the Spanish treasure fleet that we concentrate on here at the Keys History and Discovery Center, because it wrecked just offshore of the upper Keys, kind of between um, Grassy Key to the south and, uh, and, and Elliott Key to the north. Um, now with the 1733 treasure fleet, there were 22 ships in total. Um, there were five of the ships that belonged to the King of Spain. Um, four of these were galleons, uh, which included um, the Almiranta, uh, uh, Almiranta, which was the El Gallo, and then the Capitano El, El Ruby. Um, now, there were also a couple of auxiliary ships. One was El Pink, 
El Pinque, El Pink. And this was kind of a scout ship that was leading, leading the, the, um, the, the fleet, and it, was, it would go ahead and, you know, and, and look for, for danger. And it had a smaller vessel, El Avizo, that, uh, that would relay information from the scout ship back to the Capitana, and then the Capitana would, would, re would relay information back to other parts of, of the convoy. Um, now, what happened with the 1733 treasure fleet? They left in July on time. Um, perhaps their biggest mistake was they left on Friday the 13th, on July 13th, um, and as they left Havana and they were coming up the Florida Straits, they successfully navigated the lower, you know, lower keys, the middle keys, and then when it came to the upper keys, they were engulfed by a hurricane. And of the 22 ships that were part of that fleet, 17 of them were, were, were sunk and destroyed. Um, five of them were uh, either submerged and refloated, uh, lost a mast, and you know, would eventually um, be, be refitted and, and sail back to, back to uh, Havana. Um, yes, we have a question. I recognize Mrs. Muir. Um, if they left in July, what time of year was it that the actual wrecks occurred? Days, days later. It was, um, you know, it would, depending on the wind, and, and you know, sometimes it would take, uh, you know, a, 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 like to sail from here to Key West on, with super favorable winds was a day. If you had bad winds, it would take two weeks. So it all, all, you know, that, that was the problem with sailing ships was the, their unreliability. You, 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 you had to combat wind, waves, um, and so much other, so you, you know, so there's so much other things that you're out of your control. Um, but it, so it could have taken, I don't know the exact date. I know, uh, I believe it was two or three days later when the hurricane forces, uh, I think around the 15th is when they started to be, to, to be felt. And uh, the, the captain of, of the El Rube, um, you know, signaled the other ship to turn around and head back, head back to Havana, uh, was unsuccessful. Of the 22 ships, only one managed to actually make it back to Spain, and this was the El Africa, another galleon owned by, owned by the King of Spain. Um, and as he was, and uh, they actually pulled in around Key Largo, they lost a top mast, but were able to rig it up and continue, and continue their, their way home to, um, to uh, uh, Spain. And they also picked up the survivors from the El Avizo, El Avizo and the El Pinque, um, both those ships had sunk, but the El Africa picked up those ships and uh, th those uh, those men and the crew that were aboard the ships and and sailed them home uh, to to Spain. Now, one one of the kind of difficult things when you're talking about these treasure fleets is all the ships have like 17 different names. Um, the uh, the ship behind me, um, for instance. El Infante is kind, of, is kind of its nickname, also known as the Prince. Its official name is, one second, Nuestra Señora de Balvaneda. Um, but, but on some of the different maps and charts, all these ships are kind of named differently. And so you kind of, sometimes it's kind of a jigsaw puzzle of trying to figure out which ship is actually goes with which, with which name. Um, but, the, uh, as, as far as the El Infante, this ship, as well as the El Rube, the Capitan El Rube, Rube uh, wrecked kind of between Rodriguez Key and Tavernier Key here in Key Largo, uh, around, around Key Largo. The Almiranta, uh, El, um, El Gallo, uh, wrecked off of Long Key. Um, and, the, and the El Infante, uh, which is the large anchor that we have behind me, it was carrying, it, I think it was about 60 guns, 60 cannon uh, galleon. It was carrying uh, ex exotic w woods and hides and cochineal, which was a really important, valuable, valuable dye. Cochineal is, um, it's actually, it's an insect that is harvested and then dried out. And from that, and from that uh, insect, um, comes a red dye called carmine. And in terms of value for things that were being delivered from, from the new world to the old world, uh, it kind of went, you know, gold, silver, cochineal was like the third kind of most valuable, valuable thing they were transporting. And um, cochineal, if you think about the British red coats, the red, coat, the, the, the red coats are coming, the red coats are coming, those red coats were, were dyed from cochineal. 
as well as uh, you know, lipstick and all other kinds of, uh, of things. Uh, the ship was also carrying porcelain from China, from China it was carrying indigo and another very valuable, uh, another very valuable uh, um, uh, uh, dye. And in, interestingly enough, there's actually a, I know that Alamrod is sometimes, sometimes called the Purple Isles. There's actually, a, um, which is a, kind of part of the local mythology, but there's actually an island down in South America called the Purple Isles, and it was per called the Purple Isles because it, it, was, it was known for its indigo. Now, um, so the 15th, 16th, the ship's wreck, and the Capitana and the uh, El Infante kind of are, are near one another. They, um, you know, come ashore. There's some argument about where they all came ashore and had their salvage camp. But one of the interesting things about this, about this fleet, it was very, I mean, Havana found out pretty, pretty quickly, within a matter of days, about the shipwrecks. And they sent help in the form of divers and food and water to help, and also um, uh, uh, salvage, you know, salvage teams of salvagers to come you know, rescue the, uh, the men, yes, but also the gold and silver and, and the hides and the porcelain and all the other things that were being transported um, because this was all going in the king's pocket. And they managed to salvage actually more than what was on the manifest of the ship. Because oftentimes captains of ships would smuggle other, you know, little bonus, bonus goods to sell off the side that didn't make it onto the manifest. And then you know, what's also interesting is that, you know, these treasure hunters over the courses, courses of, of the last, you know, decades, of decades, um, salvage even more you know, coins and, and other, other things. Um, now, this, uh, sorry, so 1938, a, fi a local fishing guide named Reggie Roberts was, uh, had kind of, was out fishing and spotted one of these big wrecks in the shallows. And he told Art McKee, who was a hard hat diver, um, about this wreck and brought him out to, uh, to the uh, Capitana El Ruby and showed him the wreck. And then Art McKee began to uh, salvage and he, he becomes known as the, um, you know, the father of modern day uh, 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 treasure hunting. And he is Art Silverbar McKee because he, often, he once found two big silver bars and that kind of became his, his nickname. But he, he uh, actually, McKee salvaged this, this anchor in 1941. Um, he did a lot of work on the El Rube, a lot of work on the El Infante. And and kind of how we ended up with this anchor at our exhibit, um, we invited Corey Malcolm, uh, who is a uh, archeologist down at the uh, Mel Fisher Museum down in Key West, to come do a presentation during one of our lecture series. And he noticed our, we have this, we have this exhibit about the uh, 1733 treasure fleet, but we also have a much larger exhibit that will go into we're going to be doing this kind of presentation for months and months to come. It's been popular, so we're going to continue doing these. So I will get to that exhibit another time. But um, so Corey came up and did a presentation for, for our lecture series and noticed our exhibit and was really impressed by it. So a couple of weeks after he was gone, he gave me a call and said, hey, Brad, I have this, this, seven, this anchor from the El Infante, and we have nowhere to put it. Can you find a home for it at the Discovery Center? Of course, I said, yes, I would love that anchor. And um, so that's kind of how we got, and it's, again, it's connections. Um, it's connecting with other, other museums around, around the area so we can all kind of share and provide our communities with, you know, with all these great artifacts. The bronze cannon that we, that we talked about uh, seven weeks ago, that is on loan from uh, History Miami. Um, this, this lovely anchor behind me on loan from Mel Fisher. And it's about, this is not, and this is a big anchor. This is nine feet tall. It's six feet wide at the spades, weighs about 600 pounds. And this is one of the anchors that would be on one of these, these galleons, but not the biggest anchor. What's really cool is um, once we reopen, and I guess the Islander will, will be opening up on January 1st, we have, June 1st. I'm sorry, January, June, 1st. June, June 1st. Big yeah, big difference there. On June 1st, um, 
uh, Spencer Slate, a local dive captain, uh, has, also has a collection, uh, and he donated a, a larger anchor from the El Rube, which is actually 13 feet tall and weighs significantly, this one weighs about 600 pounds, that one weighs significantly more, but it is out on the beach of the Islander, and, if it, and that's one more thing, you know, kind of a, uh, one more artifact that's here on the property that you can see, and it's pretty amazing, and what's really cool about, the, about that anchor out, out on the beach is the top, the top metal part um, is actually twisted. And it became twisted during, during the hurricane, from hurricane forces, as it was, as it was thrown off the boat, trying to, trying to secure the, the El Rube before it became battered and, and torn and, and, and sank. The, the, the hurricane forces you know, actually twisted this, this, piece of, this, you know, this piece of metal. And it's kind of cool to look up at that anchor and, and, see that, you know, and see where it is twisted from the strength of the hurricane. Um, so this is, this is, you know, this is another kind of really cool thing that, we're, that we have to show. It's impressive to stand up next to it and just see how large it is. And um, this, you know, the, the chains that would be necessary to, to, to haul these things up off, uh, you know, to, to drop them and haul them back up when you're, when, when you're at anchor and, and, and going back to port. And so I wanted to share this. And also what's kind of cool is the picture behind. This is an actual photograph. Uh, and I'm, I don't know when it was taken. Um, from the looks of the diver, it looks like it's you know, several decades old. But this is actually remnants of the wreck of the um, El Infante, also known as the Prince. And we had the, you know, and, and the rocks that, are, that, that you can see, those are all ballast stones. And in those days, the ship would take on ballast stones to help, you know, to help to balance, to balance out the ship. And when treasure hunters are looking for these sunken ships, they're looking for these piles of ballast stones, which sometimes they're called, the divers, the treasure hunters call them eggs, because they're kind of oval and egg-shaped. They're actually river rock from, from Europe. And um, they're very, it's a very distinctive way to find a, a shipwreck. The problem is, over hundreds of years, these ballast stones become encrusted with coral and kind of, kind of meld into the bottom, so they become much more difficult, difficult to see. Yes, Ms. Muir. We have a question from Ryan Foster. Ryan would like to know about the dye bugs that you referenced. Are they found all over the Keys, all over South Florida? What, where would they have been? Um, cochineal is the bug we're talking about. It's a scale insect. Um, they normally uh, feed, can be found on cactus. Um, the males live for about a day, and their job is to impregnate the females, and the females um, create this kind of cocoony looking piece of cotton that, uh, that is on these, these um, sometimes they're found on, on prickly pear cactus. And they are indigenous to central, uh, to Mexico and, and Central America. And they are found on uh, one island in, in the Florida Keys. Um, there are, you can find them on Indian Key, which is interesting because, and the only way I could, the only the reason that makes sense is that Indian Key was a, was a, uh, a a wrecking port, so these ships would have come in and cochineal would have been brought on. And it's interesting that that is the only island I, I, I've ever seen in, um, in the Keys. And they're not, you can't find them in, uh, in, in Florida, um, not, not, not naturally. But, they're, but, they're, but, but, but you squish them between your fingers and, and, the, and the red dye comes out. And um, one of the, they're also used, I think Starbucks had a hibiscus tea that they came out with. And a people, uh, business, businesses were trying to get away from using dyes that were manufactured and kind of going towards more uh, natural, natural dyes. And, and this carmine, this, uh, this, this juice dye created from, from the cochineal, is one of those dyes that goes into food to, you know, for, for coloring. All right. Any other questions coming up? All right, so uh, this is another um, one of our exhibits. We have a lot of great artifacts uh, on, on display here at the Keys History and Discovery Center. We'll be opening up on June 3rd, and maybe we're coming soon. We're shooting. Yeah, we're, we're shooting for, so sometime in June, we're going to be you know, opening up again uh, on a limited basis, so we're looking forward to having people come back in, in the museum and see some of these great things that, that we've been showing. Um, if, and in the meantime, we'll still be, we'll continue to do these, um, these uh, presentations so we can show people who, who are like Ryan, who's in Canada, um, and sometimes in Homestead, um, so people from outside can see you know, what, what we have to offer. So next time they're 
they're able to come down to the Florida Keys. They'll come in, come in and see us and, and see some of the great things that we have in person. You want to tell everybody about our new virtual kiosk that went up this week? It opens up this week? Yeah, All right. Now. So one of, the, one of the new projects that we have going on to bring our museum to, to the public um, while we're closed is we have, I, I've showed some of our touchscreen monitors um, over the course of the last several weeks. And so, what, so we, we have a new program where, where we're going to put the content from these monitors on our website, and they'll be available uh, one monitor a, a week, and it'll give people a chance to click through like they're here pushing the, the pushing the actual buttons. Um, it'll be, you'll have the exact same information. Some of the monitors will have, will have, um, have videos uh, accompanying them. What, um, and and our, our first one we're gonna do is Legends of the Line, which talks a lot about some of the uh, local fishing guides. Um, Aaron's great, great grandfather. What great? What great, great grandfather, uh, Rodney Albury, is going to, is, is on that, uh, on that presentation. And um, so that one goes up now. now. It's, it's, uh, live. it's a live now, and you can, you can find that from Keith, uh, keithdiscovery.com. Backslash exhibits. Backslash exhibits. And uh, we have our webpage that keeps growing and growing with more information. Another thing we have going is tomorrow night between five and six, we have cocktails with the curator, that's me. Um, and you can register for, the, register for that. It's limited participation. You can find that on our website as well. There's also a link on our Facebook page. There'll be a post tomorrow morning with a link. There's a post came up on Sunday with a link to it. And that will be kind of a free for all, hour long discussion. Uh, sit at home, pour yourself a glass of wine or a margarita and um, we, you can be on, we'll have a, a video chat and I'll answer any questions that you have. And then Thursday we'll be back here at the museum and I'll talk about another one of our exhibits. And then Friday we'll get back to our field trip Fridays, weather permitting. Um, if not, if it's raining, then we'll do something. We have a backup plan here. Um, but we'll look forward to seeing you and thanks so much for tuning in and I'll, uh, I'll see you tomorrow night at uh, Cocktails with the Curator. Thanks so much.